call to the hospital. We had received news that uh, the grandson was in critical condition. The grandson actually died from sudden infant death syndrome. And it was just a very difficult season. I can remember I came back to preach that day. Paul stayed with them during uh, the time of, of grieving. Uh, but through all of that, our church was able to minister to Wayne and Patricia, and they actually joined our church. And when they joined the church, they jumped in with both feet. Both of them taught in our Sunday school. Um, in fact, uh, Wayne taught our men, and uh, Patricia taught our women's class. Uh, Wayne, who is tied with Doris, is the best social committee chairperson ever. I thought Wayne couldn't be matched, but Doris is right there with him. But Wayne was involved as our uh, social committee chairman. Patricia got in there with him. I still can remember him teaching the young teenage girls along with Patricia how to make roles. And uh, so he was a uniquely gifted. He even helped clean the yards. I can remember going over to Alice Shoemaker's and he had two or three different contraptions and we were able to clean the, the yard. And you know, they just, both of them jumped in with both feet, but it was not just that. They loved the fellowship of the local church. In fact, they endeared themselves. Paul and Brenda were very close and uh, Mike and Terry were very close to them. And one thing, if you're around Wayne, there are two things you could be sure of. One, there was going to be a lot of laughter and fun, and it was going to be good food, all right? If, if it was Wayne, you were going to eat well. But, you know, every day I pass by the two posts that you see that we hang the sign in the corner of my yard. Wayne put those out there about... Uh, 15 years ago and one of them's actually leaning and sometimes I think pull them up but I really don't want to pull them up for the sentimental value because he had put them out there I still can laugh at the time to Patricia's consternation that I convinced Wayne because I didn't like heights to climb up on my roof he was about 10 or 12 years older than I was and he's up on my roof adjusting my antenna and I'm glad he didn't tell uh, Patricia I don't think she could have done anything with him anyway but uh, but it was a lot of fun the point I want to bring out is this, through a difficulty in their lives, God was able to minister through the church. They were ministered to, and in turn, they poured their lives here. Serving in the local church is one of the greatest blessings that we can have, because there are some things that we do here and now, and they don't exist forever. There are things that we can invest ourselves in that are good, but the wonderful thing, and Wayne's gone on to be with the Lord. Patricia has remarried a wonderful Christian man that she met a year or two after that. And uh, But their legacy and their ministry lives beyond it. That's the blessing. You know, today we returned our study in the book of Acts, and we've taken a couple of weeks break before Easter, uh, we transitioned away. We had finished the study in Paul's first missionary journey, Paul's second missionary journey. And so today we're coming back in the book of Acts. We're looking at what is the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. And what we're going to see is how important fellowship is, how important it is to be in a community of believers. We're going to see that in Paul's life. We're going to see it in the narrative concerning those that were around him today. But we can be sure that God's desire is that those who follow him unite in the fellowship of the local church. Look at Acts chapter 18. I'll be reading in verse 22. On landing at Caesarea, they went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, then went down to Antioch. In other words, what was happening here, they had returned from their second journey. They were coming back to home base. Verse 22. After spending some time there, he set out traveling through one place after another in the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who was competent in the use of the scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus, although he only knew John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, 
They took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. When he wanted to cross over to Achaia, the brothers and sisters wrote to the disciples to welcome him. After he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, we thank you for it. We thank you, Father, for the fellowship of the local church, that, Father, we are a community of believers, that, Father, we lean on you as we studied in the Sunday school hour, who is the chief cornerstone. But, Lord, we are blessed to be living stones, one to another, built alongside each other, as part of this church. And so, Father, as we look to your word today, speak your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, before Easter, again, we were last here in Acts. We have completed and we're moving through this journey, through Paul's missionary journeys. Um, and so as we get to verse 22, as I said, uh, they return to the home church there in Antioch. We remember before the first journey even that Paul and the team, they were commissioned. They were set out and set apart unto the work. And so uh, they went out on two different trips. And now after the second trip, verse 22, they return, but they return there for season and then they would leave again. And so we're entering the third missionary journey. And so we're going to see today Paul's heart and intent. We're going to look also at a few other individuals being introduced to us, Apollos, Priscilla and Aquila. And, and we're going to see how each of them um, was involved in what was beyond just them. They were involved in community. You know, in our Sunday school lesson today, uh, we studied about the church and how Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the foundational stone. Jesus is Lord over the church. He is uh, the one on whom the church is based, not the pastor. Sometimes Karen reminds me, Rick, you could be gone uh, this week and tomorrow the church would go on and that's important to remember same with any leader the church is not dependent on any individual is dependent upon the Lord but also there's another factor Jesus is the uniting factor he's the living stone on which all of the stones really are joined together and so as we come in the church we may be of different ages of different nationalities different backgrounds Yet we find a common denominator, and that is faith in the person of Jesus Christ. And so in our Sunday school lesson, Peter made it very clear in the last hour that the, the church is not, in this case, the brick and the mortar, although there is a church building. But the church is the people, plural. Christians in the local body are called people, plural. And, and we are called to serve God's purpose. And today, as we look in Acts chapter uh, 18, I want to look at the importance of this corporate aspect of the faith. No, no person is an island, John Don said, but, but we understand that. But more than that, that as we come together as the church, that we're united and we're strengthened one into the other. And we need to be in the fellowship. We need the Lord but we also need brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you realize that today? I hope that you do. You know, I heard a joke this week, uh, and it was a church usher that greeted someone at the door. He wasn't really sure if he knew the person very well. And so he said, welcome, and we need you to join the army of the Lord. And uh, the offended person said, I am in the Lord's army. And the usher replied, well, then why do I only see you at Christmas and Easter? And the person leaned in and whispered, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> You know, we laugh at that creative response, but the fact of the matter is regular involvement in the local church is so important. It is so important. We need each other. One of the great joys of the believer's faith is for him or her to unite in a congregation of fellow believers, the church, not the building, but the people. And today, as we consider our text, I want to look at what is very clear in our text. Three benefits, three blessings 
for being involved in the ministry of the local church. And the first is this, the church gives support and affirmation. I am a testament to that over the years. Even our church leadership recently has been that to me. And, and you have received that, with that, that you're going through something or maybe things are going well. And you just see people and they encourage you and, and they give you support. And we see that in both Paul's life and Apollos' life here. Look at verse 22. It says, on landing at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church. And then he went to Antioch. He went to two places, Jerusalem and Antioch. Now, this was not just an arbitrary decision. This was an intentional decision. Now, follow what had happened. Paul had just finished his second missionary journey. There was a lot of travel. There was stress. He had gone through uh, having to train a new team. We saw in the second journey because he and Barnabas went separate ways after the first journey. Um, there were the trials. There was the um, just the, the adversity that he would face in all of these trips. And he really came back to Jerusalem and Antioch intentionally. And why was that? To be encouraged. Antioch was the sending church. Remember, they were the ones that said, we know God has sent you out. We're setting you apart and we're sending you out and we're behind you. And so he wanted to come back to Antioch, I believe, to report, but also for that support and affirmation. Brother Paul, we prayed for you. It's so great to hear this report. And, and he was encouraged by it. We say, well, why Jerusalem? Well, remember, after the first journey, there was this disagreement upon, among some of the Jewish leaders. They thought, well, you had to be circumcised. You had to take on the Jewish law in order to be right with God. And Paul was saying, no, it's faith in Christ alone. And you can remember where he went. He went to Jerusalem before the council and they agreed with Paul that it was faith in Christ alone. And so as he was returning to Jerusalem, he was returning to a church, to a council that actually was endorsing his ministry. We support you. We affirm what you're doing. We believe in what you're doing. And so we see here, simply put, these two groups of believers in Antioch and Jerusalem were very dear to him because they were in his corner. They were in his camp. They were supporting him. And in his ministry, they had confidence. You know, of all the places you and I could go, wherever, the church should be the place where we're affirmed and where we're encouraged and where we're supported Apollos received that support, not just Paul. Because you remember, we're going to see in a few moments, Apollos had great fervor. He was a very educated man. He knew what he knew, but he lacked some things. And so we see that two individual believers actually committed themselves to instruct him. But after he was instructed, he had a desire to go to another area, to Achaia. And the scripture tells us that the church of Ephesus wrote to the disciples in that other province in Achaia with an endorsement. And so what was? It was a support. It was an affirmation of what he was doing. And the church should be a place of support and affirmation. This is a place where the church, we're called to build one another up. Uh, do, do you realize that's a ministry that we're given as Christians toward other Christians through encouraging words, through, through encouraging acts, through time spent that we build one another up? But I want you to see there's a second thing the church gives, not just that affirmation and support, but the church gives exhortation. Years ago, when I was in high school after my junior year, uh, I was attending a, a number of basketball camps. I was trying to figure if I'd have the opportunity to play. And I went to a camp in Richmond, and it was a camp that had some of the best coaches all up and down the East Coast. And there was this coach out of Washington, D.C. that was renowned at the time. And I learned a lot from him. 
But what I learned is coaching wasn't just about X's and O's, although he was brilliant. Coaching is a lot about knowing how to motivate. So a coach, I see Mark out there, you can attest to it. There's the strategic part of it, but then there's almost, you almost have to be a counselor to understand how to, how to motivate, how to, how to drive someone to, to do things and to excel. And so this man, who was a great coach, gave us a vivid illustration of exhortation. And so the bleachers in the gym, you can picture, they were pushed all against the wall and up. And he, he told us, he said, go and jump as high as you can. And so we were jumping. We were just jumping off of two feet as high as we could. And he said, I'm going to show you what you can do is more than that. And so we were jumping up and down, and he was like a military sergeant going behind us and yelling, get after it. You can jump higher. You can jump higher. I jumped three inches higher when he was behind me, not because I was scared, although it probably did scare me, but because he was putting words of exhortation in my ears and in my mind. There's a blessing in exhortation. You see, the scripture says that we're to spur one another on to good works. We're to spur. That idea of spurring is to exhort. It's not that we just come to church and we mind our own business. It's, hey, brother, hey, sister, how are you doing? Hey, keep with it. it it's great to see you here today. Spurring, exhorting, encouraging. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, a familiar, familiar passage. Two verses there. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And so it says, the writer of Hebrews, let us consider one another in order to provoke, that's an active word, provoke, incite, love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day approaching, encouraging. There, there's a verbal aspect to that to the ministry of the church. It's not just being here, which we encourage when we're here, but it's actually verbally engaging. Now I want you to see how this applies in our text today. Paul left Antioch and he decided under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, not just to go into a new territory, but it tells us in Acts chapter 18 that he went back. He went back to Galatia and Phrygia, it says in verse 23, strengthening all of the disciples. So he had already instructed them. And so he was going back now and he was exhorting them. He was charging a number of people to do what they knew to do. Now, exhorting is different from instructing. Instructing is when you introduce and guide someone into a new truth. But exhorting is actually encouraging or imploring someone to apply the truth they learned. So he returned. Paul exhorted elsewhere in Scripture. In fact, in Romans 12, 1, he says, I beseech you, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Peter did the same in our Sunday school lesson today in 1 Peter 2, 11. He says, I urge you as aliens and, and strangers to this world to abstain from sinful desires. And so we see this exhortation through instruction, we're brought to light in a truth. Through exhortation, we're challenged to live into that light. When that gentleman was exhorting us, we were already involved in an activity, but through the exhortation, we were encouraged to embrace and perform that activity even better. You know, Apollos, in a moment, we'll see he, he benefited from instruction. But do you want to know what Apollos brought to the table? He brought great fervor. I picture Apollos almost like a Peter, uh, an excitable person, a person who would e e exhort others. In fact, in verse 25, it says that he was very fervent in spirit, which is a great quality to have in exhortating. He was well-educated. Uh, Alexandria was a learned city. He was eloquent of speech, it tells us in this passage and all of this. But he exhorted. But I want you to see a final thing that the church does. It brings instruction. So we know that the church provides affirmation and support. We're not, we're not made to live the Christian life alone. We know that the church gives us exhortation that, that 
it, it brings fervor. We need fervor in the church. I think of Winnie the Pooh. I like Tigger. Tigger was bouncing everywhere. Eeyore, the old donkey, looked like he was burdened by everything that was going on. We need more Tiggers than Eeyores, all right? We need that energy, that upbeat. And he was that. But I want you to see, finally, the church gives instruction. In exhortation, as we've seen, one is charging someone, you know to do this, fulfill it. But instruction, we see that someone is introduced into something new. It brings to light. Maybe you've sat in the classroom and you couldn't figure out that math problem. And through instruction, you say, aha, I understand. Maybe you've sat in the study of God's word and you've read that word over and over. And someone may be gifted in the instruction or in instructing or maybe even the Holy Spirit in your personal time has taught you and instructed you. And you say, okay, now this makes sense. The church is God's instrument to give instruction, to give instruction in the things of God, in the work of God. And so as we look at it here, we see that the church uh, was instructing. It says here that there was a Jew uh, named Apollos, but notice that he was instructed in the way. And he was instructed in the way of the Lord. Someone had gone before and instructed him. He was fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching, teaching accurately, but he only knew John's baptism. In other words, that's all that he knew. He was limited in his understanding. There was more that he needed to understand that he did not understand. And so notice, enter Priscilla and Aquila. They heard him. They took him aside. And they explained the way of the Lord more accurately to him. In other words, these two individuals invested their lives in instructing him. He, he knew about John's baptism, which was a baptism of repentance. It was a knowledge, but a limited knowledge. He knew that Christ was coming, but he may not well have known who Christ was, and he most certainly did not know everything about the instructions that Jesus had left the disciples. He needed instruction. You know, Aquila and Priscilla are a great example in the church. I was traveling back uh, from Blacksburg with uh, two of my children. My youngest son uh, was driving back with me and we stopped by, dropped him off in Lynchburg. And I've really been challenging him about getting plugged into the local church. And as we were talking, I was saying, you know, John Mark, you and Annalise are so gifted. You as a couple can have such an impact. Invest yourself. Invest yourself. And they're seeking, they're, they're finding churches, and sometimes it's hard to get connected. But what a blessing it is when not only you attend church, but you get invested. Many times we look at the local church and we say, what can the church bring to me? And many times we need to say, what are we going to bring in the work of the Lord? It is a place where we can serve. So Priscilla and Aquila, they took him aside. This couple dedicated to the Lord probably opened their home to him and they explained the word of God more accurately and he had further information, further education in the things of God and then in verse 27 he crossed over to Achaia with the affirmation and support of the church having been instructed by two members that were part of the fellowship and it said that after he arrived in Achaia, Apollos who had been instructed by this couple was a great help, a great help to those who by grace had believed. Do you see what happened? The church affirmed and encouraged and supported. Two members of the church there, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, they took time to instruct. He went out and he multiplied what he had received. The one who was instructed became the instructor. You know, these are some things that the church can offer and should offer. From time to time, I have to go to Lynchburg. Uh, I've been doing some therapy here, physical therapy here recently. And uh, when I go by, there's a great temptation to go by Dairy Queen, all right? I love soft serve ice cream, all right? And when I go to Dairy Queen, I'll be honest, I'm not going 
For the hamburgers, I'm sure they're okay. I'm not saying I wouldn't eat that too, but you know, you can tell. <laughs> but I go to Dairy Queen for ice cream across the parking lot from that and in the parking lot of the shopping center, there's a Joe Beans. I'm not going to go to Joe Beans to get ice cream. I'm going to go to Joe Beans to get coffee if I want to. And then maybe I come back and I come through by Walmart and I'm going to get great value if I get, but I'm not going to go to Kroger and get great value. I'm going to go to Walmart. Uh, what is it? The private selection if I'm going to go to Kroger. In other words, I go places expecting something. When people come to the church, what should they expect? Well, first, they should expect the gospel. They should expect God to be lifted up. But they also should expect this is a place I'm going to go to be supported. This is a place I'm going to go to be uh, affirmed. This is a place I'm going to go. I need to pick me up. I'm going to go where there are people that are going to exhort me. Uh, I, I need to know about God. I'm going to go to church because I want to know about God. Listen. That's what the church exists for. Just as Dairy Queen exists for ice cream, Joe Beans exists for coffee, we exist to instruct in the Lord, to glorify God, and to be all of these things that we see working out here in Acts chapter 18, affirming, encouraging, supporting, exhorting. Brother, it's good to see you. How's your week going? Hey, I'm glad you're doing well. Hey, you're having a tough week. Let me encourage you. Let me, let me help you. Let me lift you up here. Sitting in the teaching of God's word, one of the great blessings in all of life is to be in a corporate study, the word of God. That's what the church is for. Paul experienced it. Apollos experienced it. Aquila and Priscilla you and I can also. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for uh, this narrative in the book of Acts and how, Lord, you are using people to prepare and to encourage and to exhort and to equip people. We thank you for an Aquila and Priscilla who dedicated their marriage to the work of ministry and invested in a man who needed more instruction. We thank you for church there in Ephesus as a whole who could say, hey, we stand behind this man, Apollos. We see his gifts and we send him out to Achaia with a, with a letter of blessing. We thank you, Father, for the affirmation that Paul got through the group of believers when returning from the second journey. He could have gone anywhere. But he went back to two places where the believers had affirmed and encouraged and exhorted him. Lord, make us that type of church that, Father, people would be encouraged to grow in you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today.